right. That, and that was my point, yeah, earlier that I, I would agree. It's so difficult to restart after stopping. You know, once you get a little momentum or a little motion even, not momentum, motion, you know, think of it like a boulder. You know, if that boulder sits for too long, it's very hard to get it moving again. You got you to keep the boulder, even if it's going slowly, you got to keep it in motion. Um, it's physics, right? This is just human physics. And, and I, I, I think it's very difficult to restart. Today, I have the great pleasure of talking to Rich Makeover. Rich has worked with several of the largest companies in the world, including KPMG, Frederick Goldman, Citizen Watch America, and Texco. The position I'm most interested in, however, is his role as Executive Director of Avon, one of the world's most powerful direct selling companies. He is a master of sales leadership and business development, team development, cross-functional transformation, and through his work with KPMG, he has an amazing financial and business acumen. He has a deep understanding of multi-level marketing and direct selling, and I feel really privileged to have this time with him. Well, Richard, thank you very much for joining me. Really appreciate you spending this time. I mean, it's, it's really great to have you on the podcast. Very excited about this meeting. Thanks, Richard. I am as well. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, I'm going to just kick off by just getting some of your background sort of I'd, I'd love to know what your journey is, your education, how you got into this, specifically how your journey, your road to Avon happened. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I probably think it's more interesting than other people will think, but I think it's a pretty neat story. Um, I started, I went to college at Penn State, um, was an accounting major, played played lacrosse there. Um, I didn't have a great passion for accounting. I'm not even sure I was very good at it, but it was a great foundation for me. Uh, went from there to KPMG, um, you know, got my certification, became a CPA, and um, I knew it. I knew it wasn't for me long term. Uh, I got a call from Avon, so I, you know, I guess I got the the doorbell rung from Avon to me through a search firm. Uh, it was for an internal audit position, and all I heard really was, "You're going to pay me to travel the world." I was like, "I'm in," so I, <laughs> I went to Avon. Um, was a part of the internal audit team that got to travel uh, to Europe, to uh, Latin America, to Asia, um, really got a chance to not just do financial audits, but also operational audits to get a better feel for the company, better feel for um, how does this work, different cultures, diversity, teamwork, um, great experience for me. Um, and, uh, you, you know, from there, um, it really it really set me up for the rest of my career at Avon. Yeah, and, and what an amazing company Avon is. I mean, what kind of volume were they were doing at the time that you were there with them? Oh, boy. We, you know, when I, I mean, when I was there, I actually got there in 1990, and we were, you know, at that time, we were fighting off some takeover battles. It was a really interesting time at Avon um, where they had diversified in the late 80s um, into non-Avon, I would say non-beauty areas. Um, uh, so own Tiffany's, own retirements, in, in Amer all these kind of um, different business models. It shrunk down. Uh, but at the end of the day, w before I, I left, uh, Avon was, you know, over $8 billion um, worldwide. And I was part of, you know, I was part of the U.S. business at the at the end of my career. And we we're at about two, about $2 billion for North America. That's just, that is actually crazy amounts of money. Yeah, it's a, it's a big company, been... big company, Richard, and and you know, um, a great company, fabulous company um, in what they did in terms of development of people, uh, in terms of the go-to-market structure and strategy that you know had been built and refined over many years, and uh, I think the the reason why there are a lot of proud Avon alumni out there, uh, both in direct selling and and some out of direct selling, is that we all feel grateful uh, for the the effort that Avon as a company put into us in terms of our leadership, our professional and our human development. Now, how do they go about that? I mean, they've, they've obviously built some amazing leaders. Uh, if you have a look at, I've, I've got many stories. We've interviewed many people in the Avon field and they've all doing really well. How did they manage to develop that kind of leadership? Well, I think there is an effort um, to reward those uh, associates at Avon that show a level of curiosity. And, and I give Avon a lot of credit 
for that. And I, I kind of, I, I hope it's part of who I am now. Um, you know, if you showed a level of curiosity, a level of openness, um, they would reward that with giving you opportunities. So in my example, I had a desire or an openness or curiosity, some combination of those to travel the world and learn about new cultures. And I, I, I let that be known that I was open to an overseas assignment as, as a young man. And, you know, that's all, uh, that's all it took. Um, you know, maybe it took that as well as, you know, really great day-to-day -day leadership to help me develop. But with that curiosity and openness, they gave me an opportunity to be, you know, a very young man, but to move to Hong Kong with my wife um, and, you know, experience. have a few years there of being the finance manager in Asia, that was, um, you know, a pretty big risk they took, but I, I give, I think that's a, at the core of what they, what they were very good at, which is if you are willing and able, they'll give you the opportunity. And it was part of the culture. Well, that, that I mean, that is typical of multi-level marketing business as a whole, because there's an old saying in our industry that the cream rises to the top. And the mm. companies are generally quite geared towards identifying that cream that is rising to the top and giving out opportunities. Obviously, did that with you. Did you spend your entire time in Avon in the financial side of things? Uh, no, I. That's another part of the you know what my, I'm forever thankful uh, to Avon. So it's a, it's actually a kind of a good story. When I was in uh, Hong Kong, I was the finance manager and I had a small team. Um, and it was filled with, I would call, Avon legends, uh, people like John Novosad uh, uh, as the leader, uh, Stephen Kane, you know, as the finance, Jacques Langevin, uh, the list, it was a long list, Louise Anthony, these are people that had great careers. They did not have a staff, uh, even though they ran sales or they ran marketing or they ran the entire region. And so they relied on me quite a bit to be their staff. That meant putting presentations together. That means doing the analytics on a business model. Um, do we go to and, and enter a country or not? All those, I was um, I was the support staff. My team and I were the support staff. So I got this great exposure to the other functional areas of the company. And, you know, I didn't have to ask for it. They came to me and said, so where do you want your career to go? Do you want to stay in finance? And do you want to kind of continue to to move up the, the, the world in finance, or do you want to try something different? Now, maybe it was, I wasn't that good at finance. <laughs> I don't know, but I think it was really their openness that I, I, I showed a level of interest in other areas. I told them I'd like to go into sales. I'd like to go ultimately into general management and sales. And I felt that my knowledge of the financial and the KPIs um, really would help me. Um, I'd had some leadership experience in my life. So um, I had, I'm a competitive and energetic person. And, you know, they, they didn't blink. They said, that sounds good for us. Um, and so I moved Amazing. into sales. It's a great, great opportunity for me. So were you in the sales in the East? Is that where you were doing your sales? Yeah, I came back. I, re I repatriated back from Asia. Um, and I came back to the Northeast, uh, where again, they took a chance on me and said, you know, yeah, I know uh, everyone said yes, but let's really check you out. And they you know, had some great mentors, Harriet Edelman, Angie Rossi, uh, great, great uh, leaders from the Avon Northeast, uh, which is where I repatriated back to at a division manager level um, and then made my way through there. But, yep, yeah, it was on the East Coast and the Northeast in particular. So I've got I'm just making some notes here, if you don't mind, um, new regions. Um in terms of your sales experience, were you actually in the field um, tackling the, the actual clients or were you working with the field? What were your, what was your yeah, responsibility? Yeah, so my, my first, area? yeah, that's a great question. Avon was a bit, like we said, a very large company. So we had structure, um, existing structure. I wasn't building anything from scratch, right? We had a, we had an existing structure of district managers and, uh, and then the Avon representative uh, was uh, working within a district. So an Avon representative, then a district manager, and then I was the division manager. So, um, but you know, those roles were, uh, you know, I was in the field, I was in the field three to four days a week, full days in the field. Um, it was not an office job, that's for sure. Uh, so it was absolute field engagement, field development. 
Um, the beauty of it was I got to step back and also be strategic in terms of what programs within the framework of the Avon um, compensation plans and cadence, et cetera, but what programs were uniquely um, uh, open and available for me to use within my team. And, and that's what we did. And we were very, we were very um, entrepreneurial, uh, very creative, um, but still with the mechanisms and the kind of routines that Avon had built over, you know, a hundred years. Yeah. Um, in terms of these uh, um, sales strategies, or can you give me an example of how that would look? Yeah, for, for example, um, you know, those years, it was really a question whether or not Avon was going to have a multi-level marketing arm to them. You know, Avon for a long time was single level, you know, it was not, not going to go to a multi-level marketing. And, and an example is that, you know, my view and maybe my finance background, you know, I looked at the math and I said, boy, uh, we're missing something here. You know, we've got this multi-level marketing strategy, but not a, a lot of adoption towards it. So my view was that's crazy. Let's, let's get after it. Let's, let's, you know, let's really lean in to this hybrid direct selling machine but let's start to build out the, the multi-level marketing we, we called Avon leadership. And so we put a great effort on that and, you know, it, it helped, obviously it helped the, the math, right. It helped the number of new people we were bringing in. It helped the retention of people that we were bringing into the business, uh, help them stay longer. And uh, we were, we were, we had a good run. We had a good run. Yeah, I know. I mean, look, obviously, a huge company, so they definitely did something right somewhere along the line. In terms of, I mean, what I've found with the Avon people is that there's an enormous amount of loyalty there. Yeah. These are not the kind of people who are bouncing from one business to the other. If you become an Avon uh, lady or you get involved in Avon, you tend to stay with it. You don't want to go off to Amway or Herbalife or whatever. How do you guys manage to get such intense loyalty? Is it the product? Is it the brand? Is it the training? What are you guys doing to create that loyalty? Yeah, I, I think it's I, I think it's a bigger picture. I think it's the, the parts that I was talking about earlier. It, it, there's a culture or, or there was a culture there. I'm not quite sure it exists the same way any longer, which I'm sure we'll talk more about. But there is a culture there of much more depth than what happened today. It was a culture there about caring and the, therefore, you know, you sometimes would say the grass, yeah, maybe the grass is greener, but probably not. <laughs> um, what do they say? The I grass is here, greener on the other side of the fence because there's a lot of bull manure there. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's right. So for, for many of us, um, we had built these relationships that were really based on uh, on a lot of depth and it, it culturally people came first uh, i'll give you an example um i worked for a, a gentleman named Ang angie rossi angela rossi angie rossi and he's you know best leader i've ever worked with and you know we always had a monthly meeting to go over our people always it didn't mean that things were going good or bad it was it was a standard structure to it and what that allowed him to do is to understand two levels below him what's happening who are who are uh that what are their strengths what are their weaknesses what do they like to do what don't they like to do so then we would then plan for not only the high potentials within that group but let's say someone's not a high potential but they're just a great um division manager well we would work together on how do we put them in a situation to win it created these tremendous bonds that I don't think were unique to just Angie, myself, and my team. But if I look to other regions, other parts of the world, um, you would see that same culture of people being connected to the greater um, a group of people, connected to the cause. Um, so I think far more about that than it was about our products, which we were very proud of, but far more about the culture is what uh, really kept this loyalty factor um, uh, strong for so many years. Now, I've said this to my clients, I cannot even begin to tell you how many times that people come for the compensation, but they stay for the love. Yeah, that's right. Um, they want to feel recognized. They want to feel like they belong. They want to feel important. And people get so little recognition in the world out there. And 
in our space, in the multi-level marketing space, it's a place where you really can, if, you, if you're prepared to work and the company's got a, a proper culture of recognizing their leadership and, and the people who are doing things, that retention can be very high. And obviously, uh, Avon Richard, too. I'll follow up that with a, a kind of funny anecdote. So I think I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I went to Penn State, played lacrosse. I'm friends with a bunch of other uh, guys, we'll call it, right? And and they, you know, here I am working for a company that's called The Company for Women. You know, we're famous for our lipsticks. And they would say to me, you know, what's with you and the lipsticks? And I would turn on them in a second and say, it's dreams and goals. It's not the lipstick. And I think that wasn't just me saying it. That is what an Avon uh, person would say. We were all about the Avon representatives' dreams and goals. And that really permeated from the representative ranks to the field, to our colleagues in marketing and finance and operations. Um, it was about dreams and goals, which is far more sticky and far more um, uh, broader than what is our shade of lipstick and how long will, will it stay on your lips before reapplication? Yeah, I interviewed a girl. I can't remember her surname here. It's on my podcast, um, if people dig around in it, called Gail. And she is an Avon lady, and she's been with the company many years. But um, the year that I interviewed her, which is about two years ago, just, just before I interviewed her, just before COVID hit. Mm -hmm. And she said to me she'd made in the previous year, she'd made six million pounds mm. from Avon. Mm. Six million pounds. I mean, that is just crazy money for an individual mm -hmm. to make. And if you talk about dreams and goals, she just told me that that Avon had made all of her dreams come true. You know, she yeah, was very goal oriented, but great. Know. Yeah, it's it's uh there are there are many people there and you know, everyone has a unique and different dream and goal. And some of their dreams and goals may be about that incredible earning uh opportunity in her example, fantastic. And others are um, different, modest, or could be about, I want to be a better leader myself. That's my goal. I want to make a difference with others. That's my goal. So we were, I felt that Avon did a, a very good job of instilling that to their leaders to listen, listen for what the person's dreams and goals are. And let's, let's, yeah. let's work towards achieving that. Let's not assume that everyone has the same dream and goal. Yeah, and for some people starting out, talking about six million dollars is just ridiculous. You know, they would be happy if they could add an extra hundred dollars to their bottom line right. at the end of the month because that would help pay the school fees or whatever. That's right. So very often people join our industry with very small, um, uh, but but meaningful goals, and then build from there. You know, right. And certainly, I think um, Avon and other companies, you, you know, that in our industry that do that well really really do listen um yeah. really do listen for what is it because we know it's going to be unique to the individual so the idea is you train your, your leadership to sit down and actually work with the new distributor and find out what it is they want to do and then build a strategy or a plan for them to achieve that is that kind yeah. of the I mean, approach if, i mean from the old days to the current you know it was all about in that onboarding process listening to what were and you know we had you know, in the old days, it was paper. You know, uh, you're sitting down with someone in, in their living room. I, I know that that's changed because technology and life has changed, but the concepts are the same. You know, how do we find out? How do we guide the leader through and through training on how to ask those appropriate questions, how to listen, uh, really listen for what is that prospect or that new representative or that new consultant saying? So then we can adapt our response and make sure that we have a path to help them on their path for their dream and goal, not the corporate dream and goal. You know, this is an important point because I think that you, you, you mentioned that technology has come in and things have changed, but I don't think that it's always for the best that this technology has come in mm -hmm. because to a large extent, what I'm finding is that the leaders are trying to do a one-to-many approach. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get onto Zoom and train 50 people. And that they lose this exact thing that you're talking about is completely lost in the wash mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. nothing beats sitting down belly to belly with the distributor, finding out where they're going and helping them to achieve that. Yeah. You know, And the concept today seems to be, let me put as much 
um, noise into my life as possible. If some drop off, who cares? But that's where the, the churn, I think, comes from. You're missing it's, out it, what you've just it's described. It's very interesting, Richard, because as you know, I've been both inside direct selling and outside of direct selling. And what I see happening now is in the we in direct selling haven't quite figured out yet how to hit the sweet spot of how to grow your funnel using technology, how to really get the word out there using technology where it, but then bring it down to that one-on-one -on -one and when is it appropriate? And, and certainly there are distributors and consultants and representatives that do a great job of this. Um, I have a personal uh, relationship with someone who's at Arbonne right now who does a great job of this and highly successful, uh, you know, really good in social media and then brings it down and then really good in a very traditional real life one-on-one -on -one or one to two uh, gr small group settings where she's driving her leadership unit um, very, very effectively. I think you're right though. What I see happen way too often is social selling really just means posting. Yes. And, and that is where, you know, that is what has happened outside of direct selling where the companies are going direct to consumer and they're finding, wow, this is expensive because the cost of acquisition to do that and your very, very low conversion rate uh, is a problem. Uh, so yeah. direct selling, I think, is at a crossroads here where we have to figure out how to use the technology to broaden our reach, yet still bring that meaningful moment uh, where we, uh, you know, that, that moment where we are belly to belly or one to one or one to two, having those meaningful conversations where you can ask those questions about dreams and goals and really have a yeah. creative and craft, carefully crafted um, support plan for the individual. Because most people, are, they, they never get a chance to do this entrepreneurial thing that we're talking about here. If you have a look at how most people are working, they go through school for 12 years and they get told to sit down, shut up, face the front and do what I say. Mm -hmm. Then they go through university where their, their whole thinking process is narrowed down to some speciality. And when they pop out at the other side, whatever creativity they may have had has been completely and utterly squeezed mm -hmm. out of them. And now you expect this person to come along, join the multi-level marketing space. And just because you happen to do a weekly Zoom call with them, they're going to go out there and be successful. But the reality is for most people, they can't make that transition from the employee mindset to the entrepreneurial mindset. And I think what you're talking about is absolutely where the MLM space and the culture comes into play, where your concept is to help these people to make that transition, take them from where they are, which is employee mindset, to a point where that they where they've got this entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah, I think it's a great point, and I think you're right. Um, you know, there are pockets where people are doing this well, but certainly for the industry, um, it, it it appears that we don't have critical mass. <laughs> that we don't have critical mass mm -hmm. right now. Yeah, and I think it starts from the companies down because the leadership of the company, they just want to drive numbers. And they're not worried about developing the the, the culture of their company. Mm -hmm. They just they want to see the numbers and it's all about how many people have recruited, what is the, what is happening on that front, how many sales have we got? And they the churn is just part of the the sort of the the underlying noise for them. Yeah. You know, and, and I think that, that it, it, it bears really reiterating that if you want to be successful, as Avon has been, you have to have that underlying culture that really cares about people because this business is about people. It's, it's interesting, not, Richard, said, because now, problems. you know, as I do in my current world, you know, um, I, I, I help and I support a lot of companies in direct selling and outside of direct selling. And I can still tell you that the, the founder leaders – in direct selling space compared to outside still have an advantage here in that many of them, they may not execute well, but they recognize what you're saying. Um, as, a po as compared to some of the CEO founders that I work with outside of the space, it, it, that doesn't, what you're describing won't even hit the radar. 
Um, I think yes. on, in the in the multi level marketing direct selling space, it's mostly about execution. It's not about I believe what we're saying. Um, and, and so really the fall down many times is how do you execute? How do you make that, um, that culture? How do you institutionalize it so that everyone believes that we are here for dreams and goals? We are here to craft a, almost a personalized journey, right? Help them with their personalized journey. Um, I, I, I find more of the direct selling and multi-level marketing founders and CEOs and heads of sales that I work with they get it. it. The challenge is the execution. How do you do it? Not should you know, we do it? I, I, I think I think where and this is where the first step is that the CEOs who are coming into the MLM space need to recognize that this is a completely different animal. Multi level marketing is not traditional e commerce. It's not traditional business. Basically, what you're doing is you're running a traditional business. And you're running a massive army of volunteers. Yes. And, and I, I, I sort of put it in the same place as a church, mm -hmm. for example. So you don't just have one business here. You've got two separate businesses with two totally different approaches. And this is where the CEOs who don't have the real experience in running big teams should come to people like you and should say, hey, listen, we understand that we don't understand this. You know, we know what we don't know come in and help us strategize and put in strategies for all of these things we need to do because you institutionalize things fundamentally through strategy. Mm -hmm. yes. And once the strategy is in place, the belief follows. Yeah. No, you're, yeah. it's funny. We talked about Avon a little while ago um, and my career at Avon and what made it special. We use the words that you just said. That was part of our vernacular. We recognized we had 600,000 Avon representatives in the United States. And that's a lot of people. And we, yeah, of course we had a lot yeah. of churn. That was part of the challenge. How do you reduce the churn? Uh, but we recognized that this was a very much a volunteer army, very much. Uh, and how do we have people staying with us for a greater reason than the lipstick? And so your example is the right on or uh, right or only the money. And we recognize that many people were there for other reasons. Many of them were there not for the money. They were there for the camaraderie. They were there for their own personal leadership, for the self-esteem, for the connectivity. And so you're right on. I agree entirely that this notion of a volunteer army is a critical element of a successful direct selling companies. And I, I would I would say, and I'm sure you've spoken to many CEOs, some of the great CEOs in the direct selling space, they get that. They understand. Yeah. And and it's the reason why many of them have grown to great levels and then have been able to continue rather than spiking up and down. Um, so so it's it's really a, a critical element. Yeah, and I mean, I remember speaking to a CEO. He he came out of a traditional background. He was in retail. He got disenchanted with the retail side of things. He he did this normal, you know, the calculation two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four. He saw this curve going through the roof. He started shopping for Porsches. He decided that multi-level marketing was the place to be. And his words to me, he said, I want you to put a proper compensation plan together and then we're going to let the greed drive the network. And I said to him, if that is your attitude, I promise you, you are destined to fail right now. And the, the five things I've identified and I want to touch on them with you. The number one thing is your product. If you don't have a proper product, you don't have a business. So you have to have a product that people can get passionate about, can believe in, and you can lock them in from an emotional point of view into the products. The second thing is you've got to have a composition, compensation plan that has a decent yield so that people can earn money. But those are the things that get people in. Okay, the product retains them. People will stay in the business because they love the product. But the money does it, not what, what keeps people in. I mean, I've seen people leave jobs that are high paying for low paying jobs where they get other soft um, benefits. And the things that I've identified, and you've identified them now as well, is I call it social, you called it camaraderie, this feeling of belonging to something. 
I think is one of the big drivers in our industry. I reckon it's 20% of what drives our industry. Incentives, mm -hmm. I think, is a huge driver of what drives our industry. And then recognition, I think, is also, specifically in a company like Avon, which is predominantly women, I found, because I ran a company called Acorn Kids, we had about 10,000 ladies in that business um, selling children's bath products. And I found that the need for recognition in that space was head and shoulders above what we needed to do with other companies we've dealt with with just mm -hmm. men. And so recognition being a big one. So I wanted to just touch on those with sure. you. And I was hoping you could start with recognition. How did Avon handle handle recognition? What was their policies and strategies? Oh, it was an enormous part of our enormous part of our culture. You know, we, we, we firmly believe is one of the values uh, of the company was to properly recognize. And, um, you know, I think what Avon did well, um, very well was two areas, I would say, that, that stick out to me within their and our view of recognition. One is, um, let's be fair and honest about a recognition. So let's not recognize things that uh, weren't laid out to be recognized, you know, so let's, let's differentiate there. There is a, you know, I mean, uh, my kids played little league soccer and basketball and lacrosse and my, and baseball. And, and certainly, you know, yeah, they all got their little, they all got their plaque at the end of the end of the season, but they, they were five. Um, you know, when we did believe in recognize whenever you can, but let's be honest about the recognition so that the, you know, the top achievers know that they were the top achievers and we had a problem. So you're not devaluing it. We did not devalue it. We, it was, it was, it was the second thing I think Avon did extremely well. And of course it helps to be around for as long as they were, is they were institutionalized. So the recognition was institutionalized um, in terms of the formality of it um, and the repetition of it. So their programs were uh, woven in to the fabric when you became an Avon representative, you know, you wanted to achieve President's Club because then you made it and everything was geared towards that first level of recognition um, where they were held to such a high regard and all of the, uh, the culture, the history was really built around those programs that were formalized recognition. So I thought Avon did a really good job of let's let's be honest about the recognition, part of what we always do, but be honest and don't devalue it um, and let's institutionalize it. And so therefore everything was, it was built into everything, even the onboarding of a new person, you were touching upon, let, let's make sure you're clear about what is this level called President's Club. And then there were many levels above it, but. President's Club was the kind of the, the anchor of how do we uh, really uh, make a meaningful recognition program that has been around for 100 years. So the benefit for them is they had it for that long, but it was it was core and central. We never got off it. So what, what, how did they recognize the President's Club? What, what actually was the mechanics behind that? Yeah, so it really a great, great question. Really a number of ways. So uh, one way was with the, with uh, some some level of guaranteed it, within the compensation program, there was some benefit to being a president's club member. Um, you locked into certain commission rates, et cetera. So one was mechanical, but was part of their compensation. So there was an element there. Then there was local recognition. So if you were a president's club member, you were recognized by your district manager. A district could be just a few towns. You know, that, that's the size of a district in the United States. So, you know, maybe there was 300 representatives, 400 representatives in a district and you were recognized in front of your neighbors and your colleagues and your sister and brother, mostly sister representatives at Avon within your small community. Um, and then you were recognized at a much higher level, at, at a division level where now, now you were recognized amongst all, let's say, New York State. Um, and so we had these levels of recognition for President's Club, including in that was some iconography. So, you know, they got a, 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 a every year a brand new, we called it an Albi. Uh, P.F. Albi was the, is the iconic leader of, of, of Avon uh, back from the 1800s. And so the, every year they got a beautiful porcelain Albi and people collected those. So it became okay. also a, a token 
uh, as well oh, as nice. just a as well as just a a moment. Uh, you had both, and people had their Albi rooms. It was you know really really institutionalized. And and then would would that recognition happen at a meeting? In other yes. words, would you call the people Absolutely. up onto the stage yeah, multiple, and yes. everybody the gives them a thing. clap? They would exactly. So what it happened at a meeting, to... at, meeting yeah. at the district level, and then we would have a larger meeting at the at the division level, which was you know you're you're one of just a handful of people, let's say the district level that make presidents club, a three hundred p four hundred people district, you know a handful are making it there. Um, maybe maybe a couple dozen kind of thing, but then you get to um, the the state. Let's say you know, eight nine thousand representatives in the in the state of New York. Well, there's way more than that actually, but but in that range, let's say, and you know you're one of just a you know a very small group, so it really feels elite. You feel very special. No, and and that obviously that keeps people in the game because oh, yeah. if I'm well, getting I'll, my I'll, LB every year and I'm getting recognized every year, oh yeah, that's the, what the keeps over, that's the attention. The turnover and retention levels for President's Club were incredibly high. Uh, yeah, people that were at President's Club for 30 years, they weren't leaving. You know, they this was yeah. this was their family. Um, it was really in the fabric of their life. And then lower lower ends, like for example, the person makes their first sale, or oh sure, they, yeah, at the district level there was recognition, congratulations. We had new representative development programs where you know if you hit different benchmarks, um, you were recognized, top new person in the district, sales meetings recognition. Um, you know, obviously now it's gone more automated, so you know it's an area where maybe we're losing something a little bit, but uh, you know we can automate this now and and now there are automation tools obviously to recognize that new person when they hit a certain threshold and you know i think most companies now either have that or it's on their their technology path how do we do that um, but yeah certainly it's very important very important in the early days to recognize those first steps um, towards something you know how do you keep them going no different than any kind of leader, you know, you, that first step is to be to be recognized. Um, even if it's not a great accomplishment, it's your first step, which is hard. And also this this concept of automation, there's ways of doing it that um, that don't cut out the human element. So, mm -hmm. for example, in our in our systems, um, in the NetReady system, what we do is we've got a an SMS, WhatsApp, or email that goes out and says. Hey Richard, your um, your your downline Fred just signed up John or just made their first right. sale. Right. Why don't you call Fred and congratulate him on what he's doing, and then right. call Adam who just made his first sale and tell him well done. Right. And our system will go three or four levels up the line, and so mm -hmm. this guy who's just done his first sale will get four or five calls from his upline to mm -hmm. say, Hey, well done! I see you just did your first right. sale, and so. There's ways of automating these things that don't take the human element out of it. And I think that is critically important for specifically for as we go into this new age. What you don't want is to get a canned message, congratulations for your first sale, that you know has just been generated and spat out by, by the, the computer. To me, this is the big advantage. As I said, I have clients in both, in multiple channels, but this is one of the big, great advantages of a direct selling multi-level marketing model is this ability to not only have your automation because the, the I mean, automation tools are fantastic. You know, they really are fantastic when you're dealing with volume. Um, yet if you're in a direct to consumer world and or in a purely affiliate marketing world, you know, that automation is everyone knows it's just a reminder. There's no connectivity yeah. about culture. And what you're describing is what I think is a great opportunity. Again, it goes down to execution um, for the direct sellers and the multi-level marketing companies. And how do you do that and how do you execute appropriately? Because the easy answer is, let's just automate. The harder answer is, and more effective answer is, you know, how do you keep the connectivity and the fibers exactly. of the relationships together? Hundred percent. And again, you know, I, I I specify that is where companies should be getting people like yourself who understand the industry from the inside out, 
to sit down with them and say, okay, we want to automate. How can we automate in such a way that we keep our entire network and and that the whole upline remains involved in the process? Because otherwise what that does is the the automation just disconnects the network. It just severs all the joints because now I don't have to do anything. I I think that there, I appreciate you saying that, Richard, and I, and I agree with you entirely. Um, I've been pleasantly surprised um, with, particularly with some clients that come into the, to the space and they recognize that I don't know. And I've been very happy that there are those kind of founders, let's say that are product or engineers that say, I want to be here. I want to be in this space. I just don't know how. Um, and, and those really are, are great people to work with because they many times have fantastic product products, as you said, which is cr- critical with unique selling propositions, critical, um, and then are open to say, but I don't know how to do this. Um, let's work together. Uh, that's, that's, exactly. that's a winning proposition. And the thing is that they are starting a multi-billion dollar business. Mm-hmm. They don't realize it, but they're starting a multi-billion dollar business. We had a client who went from zero to 117,000 agents in 12 months. Wow. Okay. So, and, and their turnover is just, it's crazy. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just insane the kind of turnovers they've got. They've got all of the right um the, the ethos of the business is exactly right. The guy who runs it, he just cares about people. He's the world's best trainer, in my opinion. He just, and, and they've just had this explosive growth and their retention is really high and their volumes are high. But what, what the problem is that many people start these businesses thinking that it's just compensation plan and let the greed drive them. And they don't, they miss out on the fact that they are Um, starting this massive business and then they're not prepared to spend the money on people like yourselves who will shortcut the entire process and take them from zero to hero very quickly, give them that foundation from which to spring. And they're mushing through the mud here. They get 12 months down the line. They haven't hit critical mass. The business hasn't gone vertical. They're thinking why. And at that time, they want to start getting you know people involved. But they've missed out the entire, I mean, there's the opportunity cost, but they've missed out all of the excitement and enthusiasm that comes from launching a new business. That's all gone. And so I do speak, when we speak to our clients, I say to them, listen, you need to seek out a proper consultant who's going to work with you through all of these aspects and make sure that you've got strategic plans for all of them. Um, it, it, it's, it's certainly helpful. There's no question, Richard, that I, that um, my, you know, I have many colleagues in the consulting space, um, and, and some of them are, and most of them are, you know, really, uh, really good in terms of how do we look, how do we help people with this frame of mind? I think what you're bringing up is so important. The math, the greed, um, it doesn't work. It, you know, I, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm an expert spreadsheet seller. I promise you, I could put together an Excel spreadsheet that will make any business look like amazing. Uh, it never comes true without these other elements. Exactly. <laughs> it never comes true, but I can make it look great. And that's the, that's the risk of, and I agree with what you're bringing up. The risk of looking at direct selling and multi-level marketing is purely an exponential play without considering all of these other recognition, incentives, uh, um, culture, uh, focus on the people. Why are they there? volunteer army without thinking about all that it's only going to stay on the and spreadsheet training. i mean one of the things you mentioned earlier on which i've made a note of here is is the whole concept of growing your people now avon must have had a massive training program because they've grown some amazing people how did they go about that what was their approach? yeah i think avon did have a great training program and tremendous trainers um you know i you know one of the best people that uh, we ever had, actually, we brought in uh, with a great training background. She since has been an incredible uh, chief learning officer in a number of enormous organizations. She's tremendous. Well, I think the training organization was terrific at Avon. I actually think that it was more about the culture and more about the, if, you, if I, I look around at Avon, most of the people 
that were going into and getting promoted and getting into management uh, areas of responsibility where they had people, it was core and central to who they are uh, that they were coaching. It was core and central to them that it wasn't, I'm not relying on the training group. Like the cavalry is not coming here. It's my job. Yeah. Um, so what you have then is a massive training organization because every leader is really coaching as well. Um, so that I think is a, is an umbrella statement at a company like Avon. Now, the other part is Avon invested a huge amount of effort. I mean, for me to become a division manager, they put me in a training program for almost a year. So, you oh, know, wow. you know, it's like, wow, that's an amazing investment that they made in me. And I'm very, very thankful for it. So to me, it's can both of those. Yes, huge investment. But also every leader had that responsibility for coaching. So your training department includes your leaders um, in the organization, whether that was sales or marketing or finance. And I could tell you at Avon or, or operations, great operations group of leaders um, who viewed their role as a, a big part of it as a coach for their team. And did they, did Avon have like documentation or training manuals that, that, that the trainers could actually call on? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, very professional. So that's, I, I mean, it was very, very professionally done. Uh, and now I know that Avon, um, I was just um, talking about, about a project to work on. So I was familiar with their current, you know, it's still very, very professionally done. Um, Avon's moved much more now towards a, you, you know, an interactive, some, some of the uh, a blended learning. So you're learning on your own, as well as learning in the formal classroom, as well as learning with your one-on-one with your supervisor, or your level above you. Um, and that's both at the representative independent contractor level, but also at the, at the, um, employee group. So they've really moved to a very, very robust hybrid model, which, you know, they use all the modern technology of gamification, um, within that, and, you know, how do you, how do you engage, you know, they've done a lot of research. We did great work with other companies like Merit's back, you know, when I was there and really great companies that are. Uh, look at adult learning behavioral models. So yeah, there was a big investment in it. Yeah, and and of course, providing all of that foundation material helps the the coaches to teach the. Oh yeah, people, they, because right. it creates a single message all the way down yes, the line. Yes, it was correct. The, the coaches, um, and by the way, many of the coaches had been district managers before, so they they could speak the language. Maybe it was a career move for them, as I said before, for me. I was a finance guy and I said, you know, kind of like to do something different. Many of the di of the coaches and the trainers that we had were district managers and said, I'd like to try something. And, it, you know, we went through a very robust selection process, but, you know, we would, we would make that, uh, that happen if that person showed the uh, capabilities to be an effective coach who has such an important role. You know, desire as well, I suppose. Yes. Okay, let's move on to incentives because that is a huge part of our industry. Um, you know, there's all sorts of incentives starting from small ones right the way to big travel incentives yeah. and yeah. taking people around the world. How did Avon handle incentives? What was their policies and procedures? Yeah, around yeah. So you know, incentives an area um, an area I, I personally had responsibility for incentives when I was um, uh, when I was there, and you know, we use incentives for the main purpose of incentives was for energy. The main purpose was for short term, um, focusing this volunteer army, you know, on, on something specific. And that specific element could be a hallmark holiday. So for example, you know, around mother's day, we wanted everybody focused on a particular product or a particular activity. So we use those incentive programs to really focus the army, which by the nature of the beast could be highly unfocused because as I said, we're all listening to what are their dreams and goals, uh, which is critical mm -hmm. to our core. Um, during the year though, there are moments where we really felt at a corporate strategy level, it was important to galvanize the team for short sprints. I view incentives as short sprints. I view recognition as how do we 
weave it all together. So on the incentive mm-hmm. side, short sprints, we used it for that. We did everything from small incentives at the district and at the a very, very small level, uh, all the way to large uh, incentives that would include trips, as, as you're mentioning. Um, we would incent mostly around product or around um, a campaign. At Avon, we would have campaigns that we would incent against. Um, maybe it was a fragrance launch. Maybe it was an incentive that said, you know, what what person, what team, if you sold X amount, you get to go on this trip or you get to get this prize or these number of points. Um, or it could be at a, you know, how do we, in times of down, so in other words, summertime, um, right after Christmas, how do we minimize um, and how do we keep people engaged with us? So there's an incentive to stay with us. And so that is, again, a short-term energy play that was very tactical. And that's the way we would view it. We did full full uh, return on investment analysis on them because it's expensive. Um, and we spent a lot of money on incentives. And, okay, can you give me an example of a small incentive? What kind of time period are you yeah, looking small at? small incentive could be, let's say, in, in Avon terms, two to three campaigns, which is about four to six weeks. So we'd have a short okay. sprint. Avon, um, in the U.S., in, uh, globally, the, the Avon campaign was more like three weeks. But in the U.S., a two-week campaign. And we would have, let's say, maybe it was a two to three campaign incentive. So over these three campaigns, um, whomever, if you put in, if you were active, excuse me, in every one of those campaigns, um, you, you got X, you know, it, it, it could have been, you got a free product. It could have been something bigger if, if the ask was greater and we would do multiple le- levels of it. So we would do a level, which is just, if you are engaged in this, we call it, you do, you get. If you're engaged in it, you get something modest, but you got something. If you excel or one of the top achievers, you got a much bigger price. All part of the same incentive time period, but two to three campaigns are the was a good um, a good amount of time where you keep people's attention, uh, but keep it short enough uh, where we have a business outcome. I'm with you. And then for your big um, sort of travel. Yeah. Yeah. The travel ones were usually longer and maybe that would include a full quarter or maybe it was two months. So in a full quarter, you're talking about, um, you know, a a much longer time period. And obviously the challenge there is keeping people focused and engaged on that um, during that longer period of time. Remember a cycle is every two weeks. So you're talking about, you know, six to seven campaigns. That's a long time, many times to keep people focused. Um, so it would have to be a much, you know, a much bigger. And that would be usually the, the the longest length we would do for an incentive. And then who goes on that incentive? Is it only the top 20 performers? Oh, no. Sometimes they're far funny? larger than that. Um, again, we would like to build multi-layered incentives. So we like to build them with the you do, you get. So there is a, um, there is a group, and I'll give you an example. Let's say we're going on a trip. Uh, maybe the group, everybody that would do the minimum level of requirement would be get to go on the trip, but the top achievers got to bring a guest. The top achievers had an extra night. They had a VIP reception. They got a piece of jewelry to go along with this cruise. We'll call it, uh, you know, this travel cruise or this trip to um, X location. And we so we would try on the larger ones to be more mindful that um, you do you gets are important. Um, And sometimes we would do the you do you get as not part of the trip. So it was a program. And if you did the minimum requirement, you got some product for it or some um, more than a product, but let's say it was an electronics, a piece of something from an electronics uh, type of catalog. Um, But the top achievers got to go on a trip. And that trip was always hosted by the VIPs. So, I mean, VIPs meaning, you know, some senior man, some senior leader that was a part of their life um, as a leader. And and so it was really, uh, really exciting for them to go. Uh, the recognition was part of that. 
So it wasn't just the incentive, it was the recognition uh, was very important to us. That's why we like trips because we got to touch people and we got, rather than just, you know, the product, or, you, know, uh, you know, the old days, like an, uh, you know, a phone, um, an iP- earphones, uh, nice. And they get to remember that, but we like to, we like to give it to them personally on a trip if we can. Now, and getting those people in, you can get them into a room and you can hot bath them to the nth yeah. degree and get them fired up. So when they That's come right. back, they hit the ground. And we, and we obviously always yeah. had, after a trip, we always had a challenge for them. You know, here's the call to action. Thank you. You're wonderful. We love you. And here's the call to action when you come out of here. Uh, because you're right. At that time, they are at a heightened sense of closeness to the organization, the bonds are closer and therefore their enthusiasm uh, and engagement quotient has gone up. So we, we want to take. And how do you feel about taking partners on these trips? Uh, you know, it's a great question. I, I've when at, at Avon, we did it for only certain types of trips or you earned a partner. So at Avon for the recognition, the program recognition, you could buy in always you could buy in. Um, or you could earn at the highest level, you earn the, the, the partner. Um, I like it very much as long as there's not a heavy business portion of the event that, that let's say the, the partner wouldn't be involved and engaged with. Um, the reason I like it so much is because so many of our representatives, uh, their spouses, their daughter were a part of their business and, that's the one time they get to show some people here the fruits of my labor. You know, when, when they all see the boxes in their living room of product, like mom or, you know, what are you doing? And then they get to see them recognized. You know, it's just a tremendous um, experience for them. Oh. I was chatting with a lady who's the top salesperson or the top team leader in the world Mm -hmm. for Tupperware. And she was saying to me that on every single one of her trips, she runs a, she wants the partners to come. And I said to her, why? And she said, very often the women are not getting recognized by their husbands because their husbands think they're wasting their time. And when the husband gets to see what is actually going on and gets to see their wife being recognized in front of their their, their peers and gets to see exactly the magnitude of the business, that it changes them as a a couple. Uh, It changes his opinion. I've seen it. Um, I know many, many husbands uh, from my Avon days of, uh, you know, they are totally bought in, but they would tell you, most of them, that it took them being there and seeing it to really understand the way that their wife uh, or whomever their partner might be is recognized and the impact that they have in this gigantic business. Um, you know, so it really makes a difference. Yeah. So, so I'm pretty excited about that because that's not, my opinion was always you leave the partners out because you want to focus on your team. So that changed mm-hmm. my attitude mm-hmm. completely um, about that particular mm-hmm. aspect of it. So incentives are a huge thing. I find that that drives as well. It drives your competitive. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I'm a competitive person. So, I mean, just speaking for myself, you know, when I went from finance to sales, and I saw that there were these also short-term energy incentives for at that time a division manager. Oh, trust me. Um, I could feel the competitive spirit in me uh, welling up. Um, so, you know, for, for, for incentives as well as recognition, uh, I never thought of myself as needing a pat on the back. Um, I just, I was a stoic jock, you know, like that's who I am. Yeah. But I, I will tell you that, you know, it changed my appreciation for the impact of who I am when I realized when I got recognized and, and cute story about this, um, we were very fortunate to be a world, what's called a world sales leader. When I was a division manager, I had a great team, all-star team. Um, and we, we, we won, we were number one 
and my wife was quite pregnant with I, I, I think it was my second <laughs> child. I'm not sure. I think it was my second child. And uh trip was to Argentina. You know, the world sales leader. These are the top division managers in the world at Avon. And uh, you know, my wife couldn't go. So I asked my dad to come with me. Because that was part of the you were asking before about bringing, you know, spouses or guests. Mm-hmm. And my dad's uh, you know, really modest. Um He's a gym teacher. You know, didn't travel the world except when we went to, we lived in Hong Kong. He visited there, but he hadn't seen it. And certainly he's never seen an Avon event. Forget it. Never. So I brought him there and I think he had a better time than I did because, you know, his, <laughs> he was blown away with the level of recognition that I got blown away to meet, you know, the CEO, Andrea Jung and, you know, these really uh, important people in my life and to see them recognizing me for him was just this great amount of pride. So I had the best time, you know, watching him. Uh, So you're right. Recognition incentives are motivating energy um, for what, you know, sales is hard and is motivating energy uh, to keep people going for sure. Me included. Yeah. Look, and and this is the thing that so often is missed because it's not about just the money and it's not about just the product. I divide it up into into five segments of 20% each. I I think that 20% of your people are driven by the product and it's the Mm -hmm. Pareto principle, 80-20. 20% are driven by the money, 20% by incentives, 20% by recognition and 20% by the the social Mm -hmm. or the the Mm -hmm. connectivity, Mm -hmm. let's say, the human connectivity. And if you're only doing... Uh, product and and commissions, which many companies are doing, you've got yeah. a forty percent business, and that's assuming you're doing product and commissions yeah. perfectly, yeah. which you're not. And then you wonder why your yeah. business fails. But it's actually all of these soft things that come into play to make the business exceptional, to build an, an Avon, for example. Okay, what I want to just touch on meetings and events. Um, you guys obviously have some yeah. epic events and meetings, but they start small uh, and they go right the way through to big right. national conventions right. and gala evenings. Can you give me some idea yeah, of how those sure. work? It, it, with similar to what I described earlier, um, you know, Avon was created um, on, like, oh, oh, I think a very hierarchical, um, you know, community first. So individual, then community, then a larger community, more like a regional and then ultimately up to national. And there were meetings and trainings that took place at every level. And the reason for that was on a practical, practical level, um, you know, pe- this is not, this is not the everything of everyone's life. So if you only have a national meeting, you're going to get a very small percentage of your people that you can touch and speak to and build those bonds. So we felt strongly that we needed to have a local presence in meetings. Now, obviously now things have changed in terms of, you know, uh, uh, live versus virtual and hybrids, but still there is this, and I believe there's still a need for localized meetings and connectivity through meetings where you're, it's not just at the, the national Zoom call where, you know, your VP of sales or your VP of field development or whatever you want to call them is going to go through the programs and going to go through some recognition. That's all good. But what Avon we did, I think, and I think some of the really great companies of today are doing is they still recognize that there is a community level or maybe a team level. Um, if you're it genealogically, right? Uh, in Avon, we did it geographically. Yeah. Said We have a team, we have a geographic these three towns, we're going to have a meeting and those built up. It's expensive. It's an investment in the connectivity of, but it's all part of the investment in what we talked about earlier, which is this, how do you bring the culture together? How do you demonstrate over and over and over again that we are about dreams and goals and over and over and over again, the recognition Mm -hmm. and the new product, that was our way of doing it. Those then did, to your point, ramped up where then we would have division meetings, which is, let's say, a state, and then regional meetings, and then national meetings, both for management as well as for the representatives. And how big were those uh, national, national meetings? meetings? You know, national meetings, 
believe it or not, weren't as big as some of the, of, of our competitors. But national meetings, you know, could be ten to fifteen thousand people. Yeah, oh, no, it, no, people. absolutely. It, you know, I think, I think that some of the other companies in the space, the larger companies, could get more because they built their structure around that is the absolute end end all meeting we our our philosophy was a little bit different and that yes of course we want people to come but when i was the vp of sales at avon i'm measuring attendance at the local level i want to know how we're doing at the local level because to me that was a better indicator i could tell you who's going to come to the national meeting yeah. i could tell you i knew who was going to come because i had enough statistics to say here's roughly our number and what was a better indicator for me was how many people were coming to our local meetings. That was a better engagement indicator for me to say, are our representatives engaged with us as this uh, better, the same or worse than they had been? Because if I saw those numbers dipping, I was like, oh, that's a early warning signal. We got a problem. Did they, did the guys have to yeah. book for uh, those? They meetings? had to report out to them. So they, they they had to report out attendance. And did they have to pay to come to so them? So reported out reported out attendance, and then we would uh, aggregate those numbers. It was one of the statistics that we looked at. Uh, we coached to it, so if we saw a district. We are, talked earlier about coaching. If we saw a district that was mm -hmm. struggling in terms of attendance, uh, we would coach to it. Division manager would show up. Maybe we get a peer to show up. Maybe a coach to show up, and to help them. What's happening? Is it you know, is it the meeting itself? Is it the the tactical in, invitation of the meeting? Do you not have enough people in your, we'll call them your amen corner that are helping you drive attendance? So we would get to it by um, by looking at the statistics. Right. And did the, the guys pay to be at those meetings? Was it uh, free? Or? Um, some of them, not all of them. Uh, the national meetings, yes. The local meetings, we did not charge for. And the national meetings, what kind of? cost was involved what did you charge more or less boy that's a, a good question you know i it's too dated for me richard i'm i'm i don't even remember the numbers it was um i don't remember honestly because at the time we had a lot of people that could buy that could earn it and so to your point we had incentives we wanted people there so we would create incentives that would be an earn in for the for the event itself so, uh... so you know, the so we didn't like the event to be costing them more than five hundred to a thousand dollars because that would be a burden. It would really dampen. So we would have a lot of our programs that would be leading up to how does this help you get there? Because we knew once you were there, where it's going to be magical. Yeah, and these and these meetings are incredible. I mean, I've been yeah. to a few of them, and it's just amazing the energy it creates and it, it the belief it creates as well. People don't realize that. When you walk into a room with 12,000 other like-minded people, it changes you as a person. Cause you... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, think about it, Richard. For we, Here we are. We're talking, but we're remote. You know, every, you know, every Avon representative, every Arbonne consultant, every Amway, it, they're on their own yes. for pretty much all day long. And this is a chance to physically get together you you feel, you really feel it, and I think of many salespeople in other industries too. When you go to a corporate convention, you feel connected to the other people that are out there and are road warriors with you. Um, yeah, so it definitely is a, a way to bring it and strengthen the bonds. And also, I mean, it's it's the whole point is the scale of the business. I, when I was a kid, I was working. I sold vacuum cleaners called Rainbows. I don't know if you know the Rainbow vacuum cleaner. I don't. Okay, so it's a water vacuum cleaner. It sucks the air through the water and mm -hmm. wet dirt doesn't fly, and that's their whole shtick. Yep. And we ran an incentive, and I got to go to the States, and I went to Dallas, and there were 20,000 people at the meeting. Wow. Yeah. And up until then, I was this lonely salesperson, youngster in, in Cape Town, knocking on doors and and. I would go up with a with an extension lead and say to the person, "If you plug this into the wall, I'll show you what's connected to the other side." <laughs> and and up until that moment, it was, 
I'd been just this individual person selling vacuum cleaners door to door. And the day that I went there, I realized the global scale of this business and it changed my mind completely. Mm -hmm. And it gave me the opportunity to just rocket through the ranks because I I realized that this was a place I could reach, you know. Uh, For sure. I'll I'll go back to my Avon days. I mentioned, you know, I went from finance to sales. And in finance, I never went to conference. We call it conference. I never went to conference. And then I moved to sales. I was still in training and I went to conference and I was like, this is the greatest thing in the world. Isn't that right? And I totally got it. Whereas I thought I had it beforehand. Mm-hmm. I didn't have it. I went there and I, I, I got the emotional parts of it, the motivation, the inspiration that I could not replicate without going to a uh, convention. It just changes you, doesn't it? Changes your whole mindset. Oh, totally. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think companies don't realize that. And the fact that you can charge for these events, you can incentivize them and you can charge for them, mm-hmm. is you can make them self-funding. So if you are on a yeah. tight budget, you can actually fund them through the network. Yeah, that's, that's you know, to me, uh, again, we talked about execution or, earlier. You know, I think a lot of people have great ideas um in the industry i just think that we're missing a bit of the execution of those and i mean many companies have the ability to earn into it it's you know putting it together with a with a full financial PL, I think is people get scared right it's a big big expense um that's why i think holistically looking at it what do you get out of it and what does it cost you and how can you tie your incentives and recognition with this as part of that whole cost of within your value chain how do you include this your events because that's what we did we included that in our in our pool of money that we had our percentage of of money we're going to spend on incentive events and recognition was a bucket and we we thought of them all connected to each other and so we would make sure that there was alignment uh, between those three I would call inspiration, motivational, activation elements of our of our selling expenses. Yeah. And and some of them don't actually have to cost a lot of money. Recognition doesn't have to be expensive. No, no, it, no, it doesn't. You're, you're absolutely right. And and I, I, I again, I, I would say that the industry, not just Avon, the industry does it. I think many of them a great job, great job on this, mm-hmm. on making recognition. I, I don't want to call it cheap and cheerful, but meaningful and inexpensive. And and that is there's great value to yeah. that because it's genuine. Hundred percent. Genuine. And I think that that the the there are many great companies out there in our space that do it so much better mm-hmm. than companies that are not in the direct selling space that really struggle here. Well it's because and, they, and they don't understand their turnover it. rates are terrible. And they've never seen yeah, it. They don't, you know. Right. And, and don't value it because it's, it's a, more of a nebulous P&L yeah. factor, right? Uh, so they don't value it to the same degree. And they think it's, um, they're, they're not correct, I don't believe. No, of um, course. They view it as too soft and not, and not a meaningful indicator, but it is. I think it's, I, I personally think it's one of the key drivers of our industry. Because I think that if you go into traditional business, it's, sorely lacking recognition is sorely lacking generally your boss is trying to take credit for your work not recognize you for it and so i think it is sorely lacking it's institutionally lacking that's the that's their issue i believe it's institutionally lacking and not valued and so therefore if it's not valued something else will get in the way exactly right 100 percent um you mentioned earlier on, and I've written it down here, is that you were responsible for deciding on what new regions to go into. Can you kind of just dive into that and, and tell me, you know, how do you go about opening a new region? What are the, the key performance indicators you're looking for? What are the, are the issues that, that sort of open that country up for you? Yeah, and... and- uh, you know, I would say that I was part of the team that would make, it, when, particularly when I was in Asia, when we were in Asia and looking at, in those years, you know, really looking at how do you expand, how do you geographically expand. A1 had already had a great footprint around the world. Um, and so it was really now, whoa, open open space. So those years it was, 
do we want to go to India? Do we want to go to Indonesia? Do we want to go to China? Do we want to go to Vietnam? Do we, so there are all these questions and each of them, you know, for me, I was the finance, I was the finance support for that. So, uh, you know, we were really running through modeling, you know, and, and a lot of it was demographic modeling and applying our demo, those demographics to what we find like kind models in our Avon world. And how do we apply that, you know, building in certain assumptions in terms of how long does it take? What are the requirements, et cetera. The other part though, very important would be, you know, we always had a legal team. So there's, you know, it's, it's different countries, different laws, different rules. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, have a legal team that's part of that? So I'd recommend any company is definitely including that in their consideration because, you know, there were, there were even there are ownership requirements in different countries that, that you don't think about. There are, there are tax implications. There's repatriation of, of currency, all of those. There's how does your compensation plan map over to another another country from an even an earnings point of view so these are legal and economics and then the, then the other part that we always looked at was what was the competitive landscape and a little bit less so on the direct selling side uh, but on the product side so will our products have stiff local competition or global competition what's the price point that we need to sell our product at in order to make a margin that we can support a business um and you know how does that compare at the consumer level not the distributor level, at the consumer level how does that compare to the competitor uh, because we don't want to go spend all the money effort and energy to go to a country and sell our lipstick and it's two times more expensive than uh, than than l'oreal has decided to sell but now l'oreal is not a direct seller but that's what the consumer is going to say. Yeah. You know, why would I buy your Avon lipstick when I could buy a L'Oreal lipstick for the same price or less? And I've heard of L'Oreal more than I've heard of Avon. Mm -hmm. So those are the kind of the components. Um, and we have, you know, full checklists. Uh, you know, nowadays it's like, you got a game, is a game plan. Um, and, and for me, I usually work actually with uh, um, uh, other consultants that are in Europe, for example, or in Asia or in Latin America to help me navigate because frankly, it's very difficult for one person in the U S to know all the rules yeah. about every part of the world. So I, I really rely on um, my colleagues, my network in that region to say, because I have clients that want to, let's say move to, they may want to, they may be English speaking. So what do they normally want to do? They want to go to Canada, the UK, Australia. Um, and you know, that's what they want to do because they want to change language. But I almost, I will always go to my contacts and colleagues in those regions to talk about what are the requirements uh, for consideration. And also, there's the whole story of compliance. Uh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. In when the MLM legal, space, you're absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely. The MLM space no, it's, a, it's a big, it, it's a big, it's a big piece. It's a, it's not, it's not something to just you know, it just because the world has gotten smaller, it doesn't mean that there aren't high levels of complexity going over going um to a, a different country and how important is compliance oh i think it's hugely important i mean you know you, you know it w without considering compliance you can be shut down um you can be shut down for a number of reasons and it's very difficult as i'm sure you know um to i think of it as inertia when you stop and get shut down or pause your whole organization goes into a state of inertia very hard to move something out of inertia, yeah. a lot of energy. Impossible. So the whole idea is that you can't afford to get shut down because that slows even modest momentum. It slows it down to a stopping point. Stopping point is the killer um, in many industries, but certainly our industry. Yeah, I mean, it's just devastating. And it, it, there's people in our space who get involved who are ignorant of the laws and are ignorant of the compliant requirements and then land up in jail. I mean, this is yeah. not something that you can actually take lightly because it's, it's incredibly serious. And if you get it wrong, yeah. you know, there, yeah. are, there are dire consequences. The good news is, yeah, for sure. The good news is there are a lot of people out there to help in the industry. And, you know, uh, I'm, you know I, I know I send people to my core group of uh, trusted advisors and I'm sure you do the same. 
Um, and, and I think that anybody who is on the other end listening to this, you know, I would hope would know enough to contact somebody either in their direct selling association in Europe or Asia or US or Latin America to help me navigate to someone who can help me with this decision because it is not something to, to, to wing it. Uh, there's not a cowboy moment, you know, because there's too many, too much downside to it. Yeah. And, and you, as I said earlier on, you're starting this multi-billion dollar business. You can't afford to screw up on this end. Right. You know, that's right. You've got to get right. it right. And you, and, that's and the right. other thing is you can't change. Once you're going to change course is very direct, difficult. Like for example, if you've got, if your compensation plan isn't compliant and now you've got to change tech, you you upset your entire network. You can actually, that's right. You can crush them. That's right. That, that was my point. Yeah. Earlier that I would agree. It's so difficult to restart after stopping. You know, once you get a little momentum or a little motion, even not momentum motion, you know, think of it like a boulder, you know, if that boulder sits for too long. It's very hard to get it moving again. You got to, you got to keep the boulder, even if it's going slowly, you got to keep it in motion. Um, it's physics, right? Yeah. This is just human physics. And, and I, I, I think it's very difficult to restart. And in our business, it's actually not a boulder. It's a million little stones. Yes. And right. the problem right. is all of those stones migrate to Amway and you lose them. That's so it's right. not even like they're there to get in motion again. They're just gone. That's they right. They're gone. That's, that's, that's a very good, good analogy, better analogy. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that from you if you don't mind. I'm no, right you there. can have it. It's all yours. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's one of the things that I've been saying to our clients is, look, you know, and, and it's the big reason why I'm interviewing people like you, Rich, is that there's a real need for people who are coming into this industry, first of all, to understand the scale of it. And second of all, to understand how desperately they need help to do this right. You know, that you can get it wrong very quickly and you can get yourself into a lot of trouble very quickly in this industry. And you really do need professional help. And as you know, I've, I've, interviewed, um, I've interviewed guys like Mark and, and people like that who are in yep. this space. Um, and I'm going to continue to do that. And I'm going to continue to refer people like you to our, our network of, of CEOs who listen to this this particular channel. Yeah, uh, and, and, and as you know, Mark is who I go to for Europe. <laughs> so this is the the community of trusted advisors, well, yeah. people with a lot of experience that can really help through, um, you know, what are those pitfalls that can be avoided? That can be avoided. Yeah, hundred percent. And and the the savings in doing it right first time cannot be quantified. Yeah, for you sure. Know? It just makes all of the, the difference in the world. Okay, well, I think I had one more thing that you, that I had, let me have a look. Um, oh yes, right, getting into land here. There's two things I wanna talk about. The first of all is when it comes to consulting, what do you have, what is on your sort of uh, um, menu that people can select from if they're wanting to get, do you do compensation planning? Do you yeah. all of that kind of stuff? Yeah. So. For me, what I really break my my um, practice into a couple different buckets. Uh, first bucket is I do quite a bit of fractional leadership, so I do come in as an interim leader. Um, that that's a very common way for me to help a company. So I'll go in there and help um, actually take over the sales function for either a period of time or a part time basis. Um, and that, that, that's quite effective and, and cost effective for companies as they're going through their growing pains, frankly, or in their moments when they want to pivot. Um, so I've kind of stepped in all the bad holes you want to avoid. So I, I like to think that I can help some, uh, my clients avoid those pitfalls um, and help them scale and grow. That's one area. Second area is more what you're talking about, which is uh, how do I get involved in specific projects and advisory work? So in that case, yes, you know, certainly uh, compensation. I've got, a, I've got a group that works with me on compensation. Um, I do a lot of work on affiliate marketing platform work. So adoption, how do you get field adoption? Um, you know, many of us put program platforms out there and then, you know, 
we have a little problem with the field using the tool. So I do a lot of work with uh, companies in terms of adoption of tools, whether or not that is a, um, a selling tool, a training tool, a CRM tool in, in other parts of my practice. So a, a lot of work in, the, in those kind of project areas uh, for that. And then the last piece that I do, um, about 20% of my time is on executive coaching. And that fits our industry really well. Um, very different than advisory, like an executive coaching. I'm not telling people what to do, um, but there are a lot of founders who are incredible people, um, but but really are lonely in that who is there, who can they talk to? Um, and I don't mean I'm a therapist. That's not at all, but I am a certified executive coach. So I help them through um, how to unlock their potential and how to unlock their leadership um, to really broaden their influence over their teams. Those are the three areas that I do personally. Um, and then I've got, you know, I belong, I, I'm part of a fairly large firm uh, where I bring in fractional uh, uh, CFO. So uh, again, particularly founder-based business that need, they don't have their finance in order. I have a CFO practice, I have a chief marketing office practice uh, that, I, that I bring in as well chief technology office that I bring and a chief HR office. So those are kind of the main areas that I bring my firm in uh, to support. And that's why I joined them, frankly, was to broaden my capabilities to support the industry. Yeah, to provide all of the different areas, which a small company who's starting out might not have a CFO right. or, a, or a marketing officer, whatever. They might not have any, any of those key C-suite positions filled. Yeah, and, and, and frankly, so that's what you... And frankly, it's, it's expensive. You know, to hire a, a full-time CFO when you're a, you know, a thirty million dollar company, it's expensive. Um, but the fractional CFO, you know, isn't um, that much money because they're they're very experienced people, um, and they do it at a poor, at a fraction of the cost uh, yeah. for a fraction of the time. So it's very it's quite effective actually. Yeah, it's nice. Okay, how do people get a hold of you? Um, they can reach me at my website, which is uh, they can my email, rich.macover at techcxo.com. That's T-E-C-H-C-O-M dot com. Um, they can go to our website, www.techcxo.com, and they can see my bio. They can make contact with me directly there. Um, so those are the best two ways to reach me. I am you know, looking forward. I do go to many of the direct selling events. So in the U.S., I'll be heading out to DSU and next week, um, the DSA event in June, um, as, as well as a number of more regional events. So I try to try to get out and about uh, physically. Haven't um, hopped across uh, the the either uh, big lakes called the Atlantic or the Pacific in a long time, um, but I'd love to. So, um, but the best way to reach me is, is through my web, through our website uh, or through my email. And obviously, I'll put links to all of this Great. in the in the the base of this uh, this YouTube presentation. And this will be going out on YouTube, on um, Instagram, on um, Facebook. It's also going to be a podcast, um, which will be on all the major podcasting um, platforms. So this will be all over the place. Oh, great! And uh, yeah, and I think this has been a wonderful, wonderful interview it's been fantastic chatting with you rich i really have enjoyed it well i have too um, and richard i want to thank you for not only inviting me um but also i think it's a great service that you're providing you know your heart is uh, so clearly in the right place for the industry and i want to thank you for doing that um i hope a lot of people take advantage of of this kind of these moments of inf information and inspiration um and and really helps the entire industry through what is a tough time right now, um, not only for the industry, uh, but also for a lot of, the, of the, the folks that have been doing it for a long time and are wondering, how do I, how do I get out of this mess? How do I move forward in, in a thoughtful yeah. manner? So I appreciate you including me in that. And I, I hope I was able to add a little bit of, of um, inspiration and idea um, to many of your, of your guests that will be listening in. 
No, I'm, I'm 100% sure that you have. Um, there's been some real nuggets and some gems that have come out today that I've really enjoyed. So I'm sure it's going to be very, very valuable to those people who listen. I'll send you a link and I'm going to ask you to get that out to everybody that you know as well. So we'll do. let's get as many people taking a listen as possible. I will do for sure. Well, Richard, thank you very much. And it was really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for spending this time with me. I hope you found this session informative. But before you leave, please hit that like button, subscribe to the channel and follow us on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn and Spotify. And remember, never leave the good stuff till later.